G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about what just happened in the election campaign and of course what comes next in the Senate. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to elders past and present and hoping against hope that in this new parliament as the new Prime Minister Anthony Albanese outlined in his uh, speech on Saturday night, we can make some real progress on voice, treaty, truth. Days and times for our webinars do vary, as you all know, so please head on over to australiainstitute.org.au to find our uh, upcoming webinars and sign up for those. Just a few tips before we begin today to help make sure things run smoothly. There's a Q&A box where you can type in questions for our panel. Uh, please make sure to stay on topic in the chat and be polite, otherwise we'll boot you out. And a reminder, lastly, that this discussion is being recorded. It'll go up on our website and on the Australia Institute's YouTube channel later today. Well, what an election result. Uh, those of you who join us for our fortnightly poll position will know that last week, Pete Lewis of Essential Media, based on the Guardian Essential poll, called a Labor majority of 67 or 77, maybe as high as 83, and I tipped a hung parliament because I thought at least one or two of the independents would get up in the lower house. So I was out by quite a lot as it turns out. But what we saw on Saturday night was no doubt absolutely huge for Australian politics and for the country. There was a real collapse of the Liberal vote around the country, particularly in its heartland seats. We now have a Labor government, obviously, led by Anthony Albanese. And the big story of the night was obviously the green slide in Queensland and the so-called uh, teal bath, as I think one Liberal commentator um, called it on Saturday night. There's six community independents winning seats from the Liberals in Sydney and Melbourne, joining what will be an enormous crossbench. And of course, a lot of people forget about the Senate, but not here at the Australia Institute. And uh, the next Senate is likely to see Greens and Labor have um, a blocking majority. The Greens will have 12 uh, in total in the Senate. And of course, here in Canberra on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country, independent Senate candidate David Pocock looks set to take the second Senate seat from Liberal Zed Seselja. So thank you so much for joining us today, David Pocock. David, having migrated from Zimbabwe with his family as a teenager, went on to captain the Wallabies, as many of you I'm sure will know, and vice captain the Brumbies here in Canberra as part of a stellar rugby career. He's been awarded for leadership on and off the field. He has a master's in sustainable agriculture and a track record as a powerful advocate on issues ranging from climate to marriage equality. He's involved in multiple small businesses and co-founded numerous not-for-profit community initiatives in Australia and overseas, including with his wife, Emma. We're so glad that you could join us today, David. And now I'm gonna hand over to Ben Oquist, our executive director and resident Senate expert uh, to really unpack the results from the election. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ebony. And thanks to everybody uh, for joining us. It's lovely to be here in Canberra uh, with Canberra resident uh, David Pocock to unpack uh, what happened and what might come next. Uh, we're really glad you've come into the studio here, David. Um, how good is Canberra? Yeah, thanks for having me. It's, yeah, it's been a big, big few days, big few months, but yeah, really energising getting out and talking to so many Canberrans, seeing just how much we love our city and, and want better for the way that we're represented. Mm. And... Um, you know, Canberra has been, uh, this results put Canberra on the political map. It tends to not count politically at federal elections, that's for sure. Um, there's often an argument that uh, you need um, people from major parties to deliver for Canberra. But on the other hand, it's often taken for granted uh, here in Canberra. What, what did you find most resonated with the Canberra residents during your campaign? I think a lot of people do feel like we're being taken for granted by both major parties. It's it's such a safe and has been for forever. Mm. And so actually 
having an independent voice in the Senate who can go into bat for for the ACT on issues that are important to us mm. and doesn't have to tow a party line that's been designed to win votes in Queensland and WA and Tassie. Uh, that you know there are a lot of challenges we're facing here in the ACT that you know I think a lot of people are frustrated with the lack of voice on them and the, and the lack of action. Mm. Um, and you went to the election with a, a broad suite of policies, you know, from cost of living to uh, climate change. Um, did you think the issues changed through the course of the campaign, that people were more concerned about something at the beginning than the end? Did, did it build in one direction? It seemed like as the election went on, the particularly the coalition realised that cost of living and housing affordability are huge issues. Yep. And, you know, Canberra is in a housing crisis. We're right at the, at the forefront of this. We're the most expensive place to rent, second most expensive to buy. And all this talk of Canberra having the highest average income, I think glosses over huge number of people doing it really tough. It's not, it's not working for us. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to take a sustained effort, some really big picture thinking, and I think some bold moves from this next government to start to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. And um, did you see... Have you had discussions yet with the incoming government about what they might do on, on housing or have you seen policies from them that might work? Well, I haven't declared victory. Sorry, yet. David. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, and we're still waiting on the counts or true. the Senate, Senate soldier to concede. Yeah. So we'll wait and see. But I, I, haven't, I haven't had any of those discussions yep. yet. Uh, what's... Um, What's something that a new incoming government could start to do on housing um, to get us going, do you reckon? I think one thing to, would be to look at the social housing debt that the ACC government has. We're set to spend $33 million over the next decade just on interest repayments. Tasmania and South Australia had their debts, debts wiped. And we clearly, we've got a huge shortfall of social housing here in the ACC. I think there's a really strong case for that as a starting point mm. during the campaign talked a lot about a national housing strategy which labor are have committed to mm. and then it's actually backing in the short term a lot of initiatives here in the ACT like home ground that are incentivizing landlords to create more affordable rentals if you rent your house out at 25 percent or more below market rate that you don't pay land tax mm. uh, so we need we need a whole suite of interventions to actually start to deal with this yeah yeah interesting well perhaps we'll come back to housing at some point we've got i know we'll have a lot of questions from our audience in the in the in the second half we're going to spend a little bit of time unpacking a, a variety of um things that happen in the campaign and things that might happen going forward and um david's of course being modest as as he should be about whether he's uh, won the seat or not our analysis um and a lot of other people says that you will it also says that um uh, uh, but probably, as Ebony mentioned, the Greens will have 12 seats, Labor probably 26, um, which gets to 38. And of course, as, as Senate number crunches know, you need 39 um, to uh, pass legislation in the Senate. Of course, the incoming government can sometimes rely upon the opposition to pass legislation. But when the opposition opposes, even if the Greens are on board, um, they'll need one other vote. Um, in the Senate, if those numbers play out as we as we expect, and Labor doesn't pick up a third seat in South Australia or Victoria, what's your approach to handling? What would be your approach to handling uh, balance of power uh, in the Senate? I've said the whole way through my campaign, my commitment to people in the ACT is to look at each piece of legislation and say, how will this affect people in the ACT? How does this square with the kind of future we want in Australia? but also to bring a really constructive and pragmatic approach to actually getting things done. Talking to people across the ACT, one of the, one of the big frustrations with politics over the last however long, and I think we saw that in the, in the outcome for independence and the swing away from major parties, is the frustration with the politicization of issues that frankly, Australians just want leaders to get on with dealing things around climate, housing, yep. um, you know, women's safety. These should not be issues that um, governments and the opposition use to, to score points. It should be, how do we actually solve these problems? And sure, there's different 
ideas on how to do that, but we've got to get on with actually solving them. Mm. And do you think there are ways of um, reforming how the parliament works to make this um, change that you want? I mean, you're advocating there a kind of pragmatic approach to getting things done. Um, have we got some institutional barriers in the way that parliament operates that prevent mm. that, that, that you think we could, could tackle? Well, we saw, I mean, the Jenkins Review, uh, respected yep. work stuff, like that's a bare minimum. Yep. Uh, reading through that, that's nothing groundbreaking. That's just actually lifting the standard up there to what you'd expect yep. in most workplaces across Australia. So that's, that's clearly a starting point. But, you know, talking to people, when you watch Question Time, you expect to actually watch some constructive dialogue, debating the big issues, I don't think that's what we're seeing at the moment. So I think there's a real sense from Australians that we can do things better. And, you know, watching it from the outside, it seems like a lot of non-career politicians and independents are the ones who can actually talk about the issues that, that resonate, that matter to the people that they represent. And that's that's my hope and sort of my commitment to Canberrans is I'll, I'll be in there advocating on those issues for us. Yep. One of the things um, uh, that infected the election campaign was some pretty grubby tactics from all sides at certain points, um, and it's related to um, fixing up how Parliament works. Are there things that um, you think we can do, we can learn from how the election campaign was conducted that we should fix? Mm. In Integrity Commission has to be a priority the vast majority of Australians want to. I think we saw that reflected in the in the result. Yep. But I think truth in political advertising, you know, I've been signing your open letters for, for years calling for federal truth in political advertising legislation. Australians expect it. It shouldn't be on the voter every election to have to wade through all the lies and nonsense. It's done at a state and territory level. We can clearly do that federally. Do you think that's so. something that the cross benches might work together on uh, with a new government, try and get passed pretty quickly in time for the next election. I'd really hope so. Mm. You know, I think it, almost all the independents are backing it. Um, the member for Ringa has already put forward a stop the lies bill. So this is clearly something that Australians want to see happen. And we saw at this most recent election, I, I was targeted with, with a sort of fear campaign other independents were actually targeted by Labor mm. with a very similar mm. campaign trying to, you know, paint her as a, a, a Liberal candidate. So clearly we need to do work in this area. It's it's inconvenient for the major parties, but it's it's what the community wants. So we should get on with it. Yeah. Um, but while we're here, Eb, um, a lot of ideas about how to reform our democracy and make it better for the 47th Parliament. And I'm going to give a copy to David while he's yeah, here. Sure. Um, it, it outlines yeah, a case for truth and political advertising, but plenty of other good ideas there as well. Uh, so delve into that. Um, David, I did want to come to the issue of climate change. Um, uh, we were discussing just before we went on air here how it was only after the election uh, that the, um, the, the pundits, the media, um, everybody is kind of rightly declaring it the climate election uh, where it wasn't being called that for the election, but clearly it had a had a big impact um, on voters. Uh, what what's your take about how there was a misread about how important climate change was? I certainly think climate was part of it. I I, I don't think it was the only thing. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about the the green slide, but there were more independents elected than than Greens members. So I think it was it was more much more than that and it was tied to integrity and women's safety and people just feeling like they're not actually getting the representation that they deserve that the, that politicians aren't getting on they're actually looking forward and solving these big problems in a way that turns them into opportunities mm. when it comes to climate there's clearly been a societal shift on this we know that we have to play our part in the international community and we have to play our part in the pacific it is as someone who's spent you know the last 15 years 
in rugby teams where half of the the squad is has a Pacifica heritage, we have to be doing more. You can't talk about the Pacific family if you're not leading on climate change because this is an existential threat for many of these nations. So, uh, you know, I certainly think it's to do with that, but it's also about the shifting economics when it comes to climate. Australians know that we're, we're missing out on opportunities now, both in terms of building an economy for the future, but also household savings. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work coming out showing that there are really meaningful savings uh, at a household level. You know, on average, three to $5,000 per household per year, you compare that to a six month fuel excise cut or 150 bucks in your bank account, you can't compare the two. So this is a massive opportunity for us and something that I think will and, and should be a priority for the next parliament. Mm. How, how important was that um, a reframing of the climate change message um, to your campaign in the sense of we had that big cost of living kind of crisis mm. um, uh, take over the election campaign narrative at some point, and, and, and as you've mentioned, undoubtedly genuinely felt by the community. For so long, we've heard about the costs of climate change, take the, the costs involved in taking climate action. How important was that kind of rewiring Australia, electrify everything message in, in reframing the debate mm -hmm. for you and your campaign? Mm -hmm. I mean, Saul Griffith and his team have done amazing work, not just on digging down into the modelling in detail, but I think also telling a more compelling story about our future and what it can be. And I think that's been a real failure when it comes to climate of trying to paint that more hopeful picture and ensuring that we are talking about people in regional areas who you know, very rightly have concerns about this. Their, their livelihoods, what they've done for generations is being threatened. We've got to find ways to, to talk about it in a way that is giving them a, a, a better future. And I think we're finally starting to get there we've left it very late and there's a lot of catching up to do but it is such a huge opportunity for us here in australia mm. and you know going up to cop 26 last year in glasgow was such a reminder of just how out of step we are with the international community but also with our key trading partners and so you know i think this next parliament is a opportunity to actually get meaningful action and things in place that that take us from dead last to actually leading. Mm. Uh, have you thought, um, I mean, Labor's got some policies in this area, you know, um, some policies in the electrification, rewiring Australia um, space. you think there are specific things that they could move further on in, in, in that area? Mm -hmm. Well, the way I've sort of been thinking about it is there's two sort of broad parts about it. There's the decarbonising part in terms of generation and, and, and industries, but then there's the household level piece. And I'm determined to ensure that savings go to households. Rooftop solar in Australia is a raging success uh, and inc incredible um, what was started by John Howard. And we can do the, the same thing that we did for rooftop solar, for uh, heat pumps, for batteries for electric vehicles and unlock really meaningful savings. During my campaign, I proposed a suburb zero pilot here in Canberra, which would then actually prove that you can do this and help inform policy that, that does that. And then roll that out across the ACT, across Australia. And you know, the modeling looks like for $12 billion over five years, which is a lot of money, but it's also just a tiny bit more than we subsidize fossil fuels this financial year so mm -hmm. this is about priorities this is about actually creating the future that we we want here in australia mm. we'll stick with climate for a little bit longer before coming to some other issues and before coming to everybody else's questions which i know are, are flying in um uh, climate integrity has uh, been bubbling up as an issue um in particular in relation to australia's carbon markets and there's a lot of focus on uh, increasing Australia's uh, target to, to get in line with the, the science. Um, as I heard you say on Radio National this morning, the Business Council of Australia even, even has higher targets than, than both sides of uh, politics at the moment. Mm -hmm. But it's also important that the targets are actually met with genuine abatement and genuine emissions reductions. Um, 
the Labor Income and Labor Government has promised a review of the Emissions Reduction Fund and Australia's carbon market. What's view, your view about what should be done in that space? Mm. We, we hear, we've heard so much talk about investing in technology. The reality is, is that we already have the technology to, to get on with you know, reducing a big, big chunk of emissions. Short technology will play a part, but it's clear that the millions, you know, billions of dollars sunk into carbon capture and storage, you know, the recent um, concerns around um, uh, sort of carbon trading schemes in Australia, it all needs a good review and integrity has to be central to it. If we're genuine about actually solving this problem, then the actions we take have to be good bang for buck. We should be paying taxpayer money on things that are genuinely going to make a difference. Mm. And, you know, coming from a farming background, I think something part of the debate that we have to reframe is that farmers and land managers have a really important role to play in this. Half of Australia is managed by um, farmers. So we have to ensure that we're working with them. We're not villainizing farmers, but we're incentivizing them and rewarding them for actually looking after you know, this amazing continent that we live on. Mm. Good. We come to a couple of other issues, um, if we can. Um, you've been a strong advocate of uh, territory rights. Mm -hmm. um, what are we going to do to overcome Canberra's you know, second-rate status as not being able to legislate for euthanasia? Um, um, in the middle of the campaign, uh, New South Wales became the final state to pass um, laws the voluntary mm -hmm. assisted dying laws after a, a push from Alex Greenwich, uh, independent MP and a num number of M other MPs. It's, it is an issue that seems to be that independents have taken forward, broad community support for the issue of voluntary euthanasia. But I guess then there's this separate democratic issue mm -hmm. about whether Canberra is allowed to have debate on it. Mm -hmm. What practically can you do and how quickly to try and get that Kevin Andrews bill overturned that was passed you know, 25 years ago? This is clearly an issue that's really important to Canberrans. I've committed to introducing a private senator's bill as soon as I can, really prioritising that. And I guess, you know, voluntary assisted dying as an issue aside, the, the, looking at this in terms of equity, it makes no sense that people who lives in, live in the territories don't have the same rights as states to debate and legislate on these issues that affect us. It, it's not going to cost the government anything to give us that right. And I'd really hope that there is broad support for the territories being given that right back to actually decide on these things. As you said, the majority of, of states now have legislation. And, you know, thanks to the, the Australian for the great work you've done in actually surveying Australians. 76% of Australians living in states support the territories' rights to have, have this. So you know, this has broad support. Any way you look at it. Do you think it was uh, instrumental in um, the poor showing of the, the Liberals here and Zed Seldra in particular? You had the Canberra Times mm. joining the campaign to um, mm. get, get territory rights. How, how much of a factor do you think it's been in, I know you're going to claim victory, in, in Zed's mm. demise? I think it was certainly a real frustration um, amongst a number of Liberal voters that on this issue, Senator Seldra chose to put his personal view above the territory's right to actually be able to debate and legislate as, as, as a territory. So you know, we, we had a number of people involved in our campaign who had voted Liberal all their life, mm. but were frustrated with, with the ideology rather than actually um, being in there to advocate on behalf of the people you represent. Mm. Well, speaking of Canberra and its rights um what do you think about how canberra is discussed publicly from time to time and i'm um, i'm taken by that that phrase that scott morrison really um electrified um the canberra bubble mm -hmm. and uh canberra's positioning um sometimes in the political debate um the public services positioning sometimes in the public debate and federal government um 
in one of the last acts of, of the previous government announced a new efficiency dividend for the public service. What do you think about Canberra's mm. status in the national debate, the public services positioning, and mm. what can be done about that? Yeah, really disappointing to see in the budget flagging further decentralisation of the public service and then obviously during the election campaign flagging further cuts. We have to be valuing the public service. It, for me, the debate should be less about uh, how big or small it should be, but about the quality and, and ensuring that it can deliver for Australia. We saw during COVID the value of having a good public service. It's it's crucial and allows us to you know have what we have here here in Australia. So I would love to see a lot more um, value placed on it. The way we talk about it. Um, at a time now where we, we've got a serious task to actually rebuild trust in government and our institutions, and we need it more than ever. So this isn't, this isn't a, there's, there's no quick fixes to this, but I think over the, you know, the next few years, I think we can continue to, to value and invest in our public service and, and really talk about it in a, in a different way, talk about the value that it actually provides all Australians. What, what about... Uh, the Prime Minister and where he lives. Mm -hmm. uh, what can we do about that and can and how important do you think that might be? <laughs> Canberra is the capital of Australia. I'd love to see the Prime Minister actually live here. You know, this this was something that came up in, in the campaign a lot with the nation's capital. We've take the convention centre as an example. It's the second oldest convention centre in the country. It can't actually hold a major convention. We've got the ANU taking conventions to, taking big meetings to Sydney. Mm. There's there's no real pride from government in the nation's capital. And I think we need to be investing in our national institutions and ensuring that it, yeah, it is viewed and as the, as the nation's capital and, and the important role that it, it um, yeah, it does for, for all of us. I'll, I'll, I'll put it on. Will you ask the Prime Minister to come and live in Canberra full time in the lodge? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, that's yeah, that's up that's up to him. But I think it does send a powerful signal to to Australia that you know you're you're you're, you're serious. You're you're here to do business, and I I think to his credit, it was really impressive to see how quickly. Uh, him and his core team were sworn in and off to the quad meetings. I think it sends a really good signal um, to Australians and to the rest of the world that Australia does want to be more constructive and, and contribute internationally. Mm. Well, one last leading question on um, on on Canberra and its pride. We're, we're we're a bit of bit of a, a Canberra fan club here at the Australian Institute, being based here, so. It's nice to have a senator talking positively about it. One last thing that maybe connects those two issues is um, you, you mentioned that uh, it was good to see um, the new prime minister being sworn in so quickly and off to the quad and talking about climate change. One of the things that was discussed as he went over there was, um, I'll put you on the spot here, um, David, um, was Australia um, hosting a COP mm -hmm. and that uh, Albanese might be... It, 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 Incoming Labor government has promised to try and bid bid for one. Um, you, you mentioned being over there in, in Glasgow, and it was nice to spend a bit of time time with you there myself. But um, and being impressed by the COP and and being embarrassed about where Australia stood. What do you think about Australia hosting a COP, and what do you think about Canberra hosting that <laughs> COP, and what do we need to do to make that happen? I'd be supportive. I, I think it would signal a real change in direction in terms of the Pacific and actually ensuring that we're, we're leading. You know, we should be standing up for Pacific Island nations on climate. They look to us for leadership and it's no surprise that they, we've seen what's happening with the Solomon Islands. Um, we have to up our diplomacy, we have to up our support and we have to up our leadership on climate. So I think it, it could be a really powerful thing to announce that we're we're back and we're we're going to be part of solving this problem i mean climate climate change is personal for a lot of australians now you, you think back to the the bushfires here in canberra the worst air quality in the world straight into a two years of a global 
pandemic, I think we'd had enough time to actually process those those bushfires. And then we've seen you know floods, floods up north, fires in WA. Uh, we've had warning after warning from the IPCC. We just need the political will now to actually get on with doing what leaders should be doing is dealing with problems. Mm. And can we ask the government to host the COP in Canberra? Well, we've got the facilities. I don't think at the moment, uh, which is a real shame. Mm. Um, you know, the business community in Canberra has been banging on about a, a fit for purpose convention center for over a decade. Mm. Every year they turn away 20 to $25 million worth of business just because it's too small. Mm. It, it could be great for Canberra to actually invest in something like that. That can not only hold international sort of sh uh, showpiece events like a COP, but also hosts, you know, government um, conferences and cybersecurity. There's there's so many great industries here in, in Canberra that I think would make use of a facility like that. I'm going to ask a couple of, a couple more questions before we throw to the back to Ebony and get her to um, uh, get us into what the mm -hmm. audience wants to ask you. Um, I've got a couple of um, uh, more more personal questions. David, when did you decide to run mm -hmm. um, uh, for the Senate and how different or similar was the campaign to what you anticipated? What was the kind of surprise mm -hmm. or what you didn't expect mm -hmm. from where you started to where you ended up? Yeah. So early last year, a group called ProAct formed, which was really modeled off the Voices um, of Indi group. And they started looking for an independent Senate candidate. So I had a number of people last throughout last year hassling me saying, we really believe there's a, there's a pathway for an independent in the Senate and the ACT. It's never been done before, but it is possible. Would you consider it? I was working on a conservation and agriculture project in Zimbabwe and, you know, thought about it, but didn't think it was something I wanted to do. I guess as, as time went on, I thought about the things that I care about and the opportunity to actually represent a community that I love. I've, I've said for years that we need less career politicians. We need people who don't actually need to be in politics, but want to be there to contribute. And yeah, then I guess going up to COP26, you actually see how important leadership on these big issues is and the difference it does make. And talking to people from, you know, different countries saying, we, we just don't understand what's happening in, in Australia. This is such an opportunity for you guys. Um, and that yet you're, you're not only not acting, but you're trying to undermine our efforts to, to look after our own country. So, yeah, after that, I decided to put my put my hand up and, and went through the sort of endorsement process for ProAct and was endorsed as the community candidate. I think it surprised me, I think just how energizing I found it. Mm. You know, getting out and, and meet, meeting thousands of Canberrans and groups and, and we've, we have such an incredible city. So many interesting people working on interesting problems and doing what they feel like is really meaningful work so yeah i, I really enjoyed it we had a great little team we ended up with just over 2200 volunteers which just blew me away you know mm -hmm. the amount of time and effort that people put in to this many of them for the first time mm -hmm. and that was one of the cool things about it is, you know we'd often have these little meetups for new volunteers and you'd go around the circle and they'd say you know this is me for the first getting involved for the first time I said yeah me too mm. <laughs> this is all new but this is this is exciting and, and we can we can hopefully really contribute here mm. one last thing before I go to you Ebony um you seem very relaxed composed guy David a um, number of people commented on it to me how are you like this um uh is there music you like to listen to is there things you like to read what is it that keeps you in 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 fine form and and relaxed and calm, especially through you know such a, a big thing as a campaign and and now being the big surprise packet uh, in the Senate? Yeah, one of the things that 
I was criticised a lot for during the campaign was, you know, how does playing professional sport in any way prepare you or qualify you to run for politics? One, I was involved in a whole bunch of other stuff outside of professional sport, but I think there are a number of things that that does actually prepare you for. A big part of it is that is work, obviously working in a, as a team, driving what's best for the team as, as a leader, being able to work with people that you don't necessarily agree with, uh, but you've got some sort of common goal. I think the other thing is around performing under pressure and yeah, being able to just kind of roll with it and try and maintain, um, I don't know, you're cool and yeah, good, get a good night's sleep when you're under pressure. Mm. So yeah, hopefully I can use all those, those things. Should I, should I be a Senator for the ACT? Mm, terrific. Well, anyway, we better let the audience, I know there's a big one online and they will have been asking lots of questions. We better, I better give them some time. So over to you. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, we've got uh, more than 50 questions here, so we're not going to get through all of them, I'm afraid, but we've got close to 800 people on the line with us with lots of questions. So thank you so much, everyone, for your interest. Um, David, I want to start with this first question from Greg Ebeling, who says, um, David, will you help and end the $11.6 billion in fossil fuel subsidies and how would you reinvest that money. Could you talk to us a little bit about that level of fossil fuel subsidies and what you think can be done about it? It's a big one. Um, uh, certainly not something I think you can just turn turn off, but we clearly have to reprioritize the way that we spend money in Australia. Mm. You know, uh, this was the first budget, this recent budget was, I guess, the first one that I've been really more engaged in and, and interested in and and for me the budget is about what you're prioritizing as a nation you're signaling the direction you want to go the problems you want want to solve and clearly where we are with climate spending almost 12 billion dollars subsidizing fossil fuels fossil fuels have been great for us in the past you know we we shouldn't demonize them or the people who've worked in the fossil fuel industries they're clearly not the future. So this is something that we're going to have to face up to and really work hard to ensure that people in regional areas are looked after, that we're investing in those areas, that renewable projects are going there, that industries of the future like green steel, that we're actually doing the research and development to, to begin to become leaders in that field. Mm. I think Sweden are already shipping green steel. Mm. That should be our, mm. that, sh that, that should be us. Mm. Do you think fossil fuel, sorry, I'm going to do a little follow-up here. Do you think fossil fuel subsidies and, as you said, not potentially ending them overnight, but doing something about them is something that might unite the teal crossbench and the greens and that's something that everybody could agree to pursue the new government on? You'd hope so. I mean, that's, that's a lot of money that you could be in, investing in electrifying households or building industries for the future that will create far more jobs. Mm. You know, that's been one of the, the great marketing wins of the fossil fuel industry is inflating in people's minds just how, how, how many people are employed in that industry. Uh, we have to be investing in other areas. And, and as I said, you know, Saul Griffith's modeling suggests 12 billion over five years to electrify every household in Australia, unlocking billions and billions of dollars of savings. Much of that will then be spent locally. In Canberra alone, we spend $950 million every year on fuel and energy. And the, the vast majority of that is on foreign oil. And we're seeing at the moment, you know, petrol back up above two bucks a litre. Mm. This is really hurting, hurting people. Mm. Um, the next question I've got, uh, I think, follows on a little bit. It's from Wendy Farmer, who is joining us from the Latrobe Valley and says, while we've seen the previous government's love of coal and adding confusion in the energy market, she asks, if you're in Parliament, how would you make sure that the new government supports coal communities through this transition while we take action on climate change? Yeah. It, it was very clear consulting with people across 
the ACT, people want an orderly transition. It's what, it's what we've been missing is a, is a big picture plan and policies that actually do this, that invest in areas that have had uh, a number of people involved in coal and, and gas for, for a long time now. The reality is, is this is starting to happen. You look at the Hunter Renewal Project, communities are aware that, that the end of fossil fuels is coming. And so it's really important that we are assisting communities to do that, to plan. And, you know, for a lot of those communities, it may be that if you're a coal miner, you may retire as a coal miner, but your kids won't be coal miners. There'll be other industries for them. And, you know, having spoken to a few people who have gone from the coal industry are now working in uh, renewables, say wind farms, they they've they've loved the 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 transition um it's been better for them and their families they can live locally they've got a well well paid secure job so we have to ensure that this is done in done in an orderly way and in a way that actually benefits these these regional areas um i've got a couple of questions in here about coal and gas um developments and mining but Given your involvement in agriculture, and I know in the past being involved in helping farmers in particular protect their land from fossil fuel developments that are inappropriate, um, wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about your activism in that space and how important, not just for coal communities, but also farming communities, it is um, to, um, uh, to tackle new gas and coal projects that um, aren't needed or aren't welcome in certain places. Yeah, you know, much was made during the campaign about my involvement in a in a protest with a fifth generation farmer, Rick Laird, in Malls Creek, uh, end of twenty fourteen, protesting a coal mine on some of our best agricultural land in Australia, the Liverpool Plains. Makes no sense that we will be setting up fossil fuel projects on our best agricultural land in Australia. And I think we have to be standing up for farmers more. We, I think in the Australian psyche, we like to talk about farmers and, and think that we're looking out for them, but I think the reality is we aren't. And it's been, it's been really disappointing to see the nationals policy and, and sort of agitation when it comes to climate, given that the government's own figures show that the average farmer in Australia has missed out on 22% or their profits come down 22% every year since the year 2000, which is, which is huge for, for farmers. So this is clearly something that we have to act on. And I think we have to re, re look at, at the way that the EPBC Act is dealing with these sorts of developments you know the Samuel review showed that the EPBC Act is not fit for purpose anymore it's not actually um, working to safeguard our biodiversity. You got something that sorry I have a quick follow-up there he's got something you think that new Labor environment minister whoever they are should be doing in that uh, environmental protection and biodiversity space? I mean we've seen the state of the environment report I think it was delivered in December due to come out in January we still haven't seen that mm -hmm. so I think releasing the report and you know Australians want to look after our wildlife and it, it should be more of a priority it's we're grossly underspending in that area and we're seeing you know just last year 30 I think it was 37 new species were were upgraded on the threatened species list for a country like Australia that's that's not good enough mm -hmm. Um, we can and should be doing more in that area. Uh, I've got a kind of follow-up question. Um, uh, the Australia Institute has done a lot of research on the impacts of putting a moratorium on new coal mines, uh, showing it would have a negligible effect on our economy and really arguing that there's no place to open new coal mines. Um, and we've, we've joined with Pacific Islands in 
backing a, a global moratorium on new coal mines in particular. But I've got a question here from John Knox, who says, are you likely to take a similar stance to the Greens on no new coal and gas mines or, or projects? Could you talk to us a little bit about the role of new projects and how you would approach that in the Senate? Sure. Uh, now I've said during the campaign, we need a pragmatic way forward on climate. For me, that looks like, like Zali Stegall's climate bill actually legislating 60% uh, by, by 2030, creating a plan to get there. I'm not, I'm not sure if the way to do that is to actually go with a, a, a moratorium. I think actually having the targets and moving Australia forward in terms of electrification, in terms of investing in renewables and in, in investing in the regions, I think the result could be could be very similar without having to go through more sort of climate wars and and um, everything that that has. It's been so damaging uh, for Australia. Uh, the next question I've got here is from Robin Gardner, who asks, will you actively support Helen Haynes proposed ICAC model with truth in advertising, proper funding, uh, et cetera, if we can move to that issue of integrity? Yeah, yeah. Very, very quickly, yes. During the campaign, I, I backed Helen Haynes' bill. It's been, it was a huge process of consultation. It's been lauded as the gold standard when it comes to an, an integrity commission. Labor have come out and said that they will prioritise it. They've said, uh, you know, hopefully by December. So I would hope that they will back um, Helen's bill. We'll, we'll wait and see, you know, should they have to go through the whole consultation and redrafting process that could could really delay things. Um, the next question I've got is from Gordon Churchman, who asks, will you work towards an end to the cruel refugee stance of the big parties and will genuine refugees be able to come and stay in Australia? Mm -hmm. This was something that came up a lot during the campaign. Uh, my sense is that people in, in Canberra want a more compassionate approach what we're doing at the moment is cruel and it's also incredibly expensive we have to we have to find a better way of dealing with refugees having said that we can't go back to the madness we saw in the in the 2010s with boat arrivals and you know both sides of politics um, doing what they were doing so it's a it's a really big one it's going to be a challenge um, but would certainly, you know, support um, a more pragmatic way to actually deal with this issue and, and to ensure that people who are genuine refugees in Australia can contribute and they're not being held in limbo for, you know, years and years. Uh, I've got a couple of people in here kind of commenting on the actual election results and, um, the shift away from the major parties. John Neve is asking how damaging the two-party system has been for creating the situation we are now in. But David, I just wondered if you could reflect on that um, kind of big shift from voters away from the major parties and if you see that as something that's kind of here to stay and in your experiences with voters, um, you know, out on the hustings, what was the feedback that you were getting from people? And then Ben, I might get you to kind of give us a big picture um, on the results after that. But David, what was the feedback from people on the ground? Yeah, I'm certainly no political expert talking to people, I think there were a few things, a frustration about being taken for granted as such a safe, you know, an area of safe seats here in, here in the ACT, frustration around the politicisation of issues like climate, where people just want uh, government to get on with the, with, the, with the way forward and actually dealing with it. But then I think also seeing what independence around the country have been able to do to actually represent their communities on issues that are important to them. And for example, in, you know, in the last Senate, Senator Patrick, the work he was doing around freedom of information and, and integrity, uh, Jackie Lambie really going into Batford, Tasmania, having their social housing debt 
wiped, you know, almost single-handedly getting a getting a um, Royal Commission to Veteran Suicides, despite what the major parties say, independents can actually get things done. And there's clearly going to be a really important role for independents going forward. And I think it's a it's a great wake-up call for the major parties to reconnect with the people that they are actually in there to represent. One of the other things which I think ties ties into it and, and finally this election became an issue was money in politics and political donation reform. I think it's something that should be on the, the agenda. We should be looking at more transparency around political donations, potentially looking at, at caps because it's clearly corrosive and Australians know it now. They know that it's having an influence and you know, politicians are making decisions that aren't actually in the best interests of everyday Australians. Mm. Ben, I wonder if I might just come to you. Um, I know we've been very focused on the ACT and the Senate in particular, but as I kind of talked about it right at the beginning, this is a bit of a bombshell um, election result on a number of fronts. How much is this shift or the shifts that we saw on Saturday night going to change politics in general moving forward, do you think? Well, I think David's win in the ACT is emblematic of something bigger that happened across Australia, and David's part of that. He's led it. He's been involved in it. There are some things that are specific to the ACT, why it happened here, but there are also some themes it's feeding into nationally, and I, I do think this is the most transformative election since, in Australia since 1972. Um, Labor's win in the House of Representatives is narrow in the sense of they're only just going to get to 76 seats probably, but uh, while they didn't win in a landslide, the coalition lost in a landslide and it's going to be reduced to the smallest number of seats uh, proportionally in they've had in the House of Representatives since the Second World War. And that underscores what a big shift has happened. Um, David's right. The trend away from the major parties uh, was exacerbated this election. The coalition Labor Party vote combined will be less than 70%. It was 75% um, at the last election, and there's been a long-term decline, partly as part of a global trend um, that's seeing a realignment of politics. And in a way, I think this is election where you saw the dam burst um, uh, in a number of ways, not just the success of the independents and not just the success of the Greens, but Labor won a whole lot of seats too that you wouldn't normally expect them to win. Seats like um, Higgins, um, in Melbourne, uh, a seat that um, has been held by former prime ministers and um, former treasurers, Labor was able to win it, whereas an independent won uh, Kuyong and David Pocock's won here in the ACT. So it, it it's an election that has really changed the makeup of politics. Now, actually, the physical makeup of the parliament is going to be changed. And I think if you, you imagine sitting in the Senate or in the House of Representatives, as a prime minister and opposition leader and looking across the chamber, you won't just be looking at um, your opponent, you'll be looking at a kind of new um, reality. Um, across both houses of parliament, there's likely to be about 35 cross benches in total. If you add them all up, that, that's a sizable change in the chamber. And I think it's gonna to lead to a sizable change in the debate. Um, on climate change, we've so long been talking about why well, we can't take action. And I think the debate really moves now into how we can take faster action. Um, that's just one example. And I think we're going to see a very transformed debate. That's not to say all our problems are going to be solved quickly and easily. There's going to be plenty of disappointments, but we are. Uh, uh, it is a, a transformative election that's going to change debates in all sorts of ways we haven't quite expected. And yeah, clearly David's a big part of that. David, uh, I'm going to exercise my prerogative as host and ask a question uh, myself. We've seen a lot of um, the community independents um, running as professional women standing, but also raising that issue of gender equality. Um, we've seen some appalling behaviour in Parliament um, that's kind of, I think, yet to be addressed. Um, and I just feel like in your sporting career, you've been a very powerful advocate against homophobia and, and racism, how will you tackle promoting gender equality while you're in the Senate? Mm. This was one of the, the criticisms was that I, I'm, I'm not a woman running um, 
for for the seat the senate is fortunately one of the areas that we do have equal representation there's so much to do in this area i think we're, we're seeing um finally more of a spotlight on it but it's going to take more leadership but it's i think it's also about challenging some of the societal norms and i think that takes men actually standing up and saying this shouldn't be thought of as a women's issue this is also a men's issue and we've got to change the way that we behave we've got to be calling out behavior in our workplaces in, in our families and really yeah trying trying to change the way that we we treat treat women um around us and yeah i i think there is an expectation that over the next parliament this will be an issue that is addressed given what we saw in in the last parliament yeah, Eb, just to interrupt with a quick stat for you there um leading on something david said the senate now is going to probably track for 50 57 percent women um, and the House is going to move up from its current 29% to 37.1%. So, yeah, clearly the Senate's doing uh, a lot better. Um, and I know our, our colleague here in the Democracy and Accountability Program, Bill Brown, has pointed to proportional representation as being one of the key drivers that has meant the Senate is now a, a clear majority um, of women. Um, and we don't have much time left, but um, I'm just interested in kind of how you approach those conversations, because I feel like um, in particular, the way you've challenged homophobia while you were in professional sport, I feel like those are maybe um, conversations that people are reluctant to have. And it's really about changing a culture there. Um, how did you approach that when you encountered that kind of thing and standing up for, you know, other members of your team or other things. How is it that you have those have had those conversations in the past in perhaps sometimes spaces where people don't really want to talk about it? Yeah, I mean, cultural change is is uncomfortable. It, it requires a lot of us to actually get out of our comfort zone and have have those conversations that we'd rather not have. But I think at the end of the day, it is a lot about education and and challenging things that we just pick up when we're kids from from our parents from from our our culture and having honest conversations about why it's detrimental how we can actually move move beyond it there's there's no there's no easy fixes to this i guess my my approach in rugby around homophobia was my feeling was it shouldn't be up to um, a teammate that I had that may be gay to actually advocate. It's, it's up to all of us to create the kind of inclusive environment where people can be who they are, contribute, express themselves, and we all benefit from that. Thank you so much. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes to go, so we'll have to wrap it up there. I'm really sorry that we couldn't get to everyone's questions. There were some fantastic ones in there. Thank you so much, everyone in the chat for an excellent discussion as well. And of course, thank you to Ben Oquist and David Pocock, independent Senate candidate for the ACT and likely to secure that second Senate spot as soon as we can finish counting those Senate votes and preferences. Thank you so much for your time today, David. I know um, it must have been a very flat out campaign and um and still a, a bit of a ways before you might be able to to claim victory but we really appreciate your time today no thanks Ebony. great to be here thanks, <laughs> thanks David. lovely Cheers. thanks very much everyone for joining us um the australia institute uh does have webinars coming up we'll do uh, a poll position next week potentially at a different time with pete lewis from guardian australia and Catherine murphy from uh, sorry Catherine Murphy from Guardian Australia and Pete Lewis from the Essential Poll. Um, Richard Dennis will be joining them because I'm going on leave. So I'll see you in a few weeks time, but uh, all dates for our upcoming politics in the pub events, webinars, all that kind of stuff, as well as our research on climate and energy and democracy and accountability. Some of that stuff we canvassed today, you can find at australiainstitute.org.au. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Stay safe out there and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks, Ab. Thanks, people. Thank you. <laughs>